Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to DP UK for the opportunity to talk to you all today about the hot mess that is secondary care electronic health records and what we might be able to do about it. So um, from the very first presentation in this conference, we've been talking about precision and about finding the right patient with the right disease at the right time. Electronic health records provide, in principle, exactly the kind of broad and rich data set that you would need, that you would want, to be able to find those patients to deliver trials to them, to recruit them. But needless to say, electronic health record data is not without its challenges, and today I'm going to talk about a few of those challenges and what we at Acrivia are, uh, how we are addressing them. There's a theme that's going to run through these solutions, which is the use of AI and specifically the use of natural language processing. Uh, I'm not going to be focusing on the technical details of AI methods. Uh, I am afraid I'm not going to be talking about ChatGPT at all. Uh, but rather the way in which NLP can be used as a mechanism uh, for introducing clinical domain knowledge into a translational research process, how you can get clinicians' understanding of the diseases that they see in clinic embedded into the research pipeline. Uh, so a little bit of background just quickly about who we are at Acrivia Health. This is our first time at DP UK, hopefully the first of many. Uh, so we span out from Oxford University in 2019. Uh, previously, the team behind the company were uh, responsible for the UK CRIS program. So that was a NIHR-funded project to de-identify, curate, and centralize uh, electronic health records from 11 uh, NHS psychiatric secondary healthcare hospitals in England and Wales. And the purpose of that project was to make that electronic health record data available to NHS research teams, where previously it's been inaccessible even for the trusts that control the data. So the purpose of spin-out and becoming a Acrivia Health was to take that information governance model, that data security model that we developed and road tested extensively over 10 years with the NHS, and build on top of it to develop a model that could be used to deliver research outside the NHS using that underlying data resource, which is probably as of today above 4 million patients. So it's very much targeted at figuring out what routes to access for academia and industry uh, for that fundamental resource. As I said, this process and the process of using an electronic health uh, record data resource is not without its challenges, so let's talk about the first one, the challenge of analyzing EHR data. So that uh, any clinicians who've worked in psychiatry in the NHS will attest, there is a feature of psychiatric electronic health records, at least in the NHS, which is that they are highly unstructured. And this is illustrated by this iceberg analogy, where you'll have a small amount of coded at source structured data on things like referrals, demographics, some diagnosis information. Uh, those things which the electronic health record systems, being administrative systems, are set up, designed to capture. But you have, that's about it. And there are some quite shocking omissions from the structured data. For example, there is no structured data on medication in NHS psychiatric electronic health records. A lot of sites are introducing electronic prescribing systems, but they're not here yet. And until then, all the medication information is captured in free text. Diagnosis, you do get coded diagnosis, but depending on the site, it can range from 50, 60% of patients with any diagnosis all the way down to 5 or 10% of patients with any diagnosis, coded diagnosis information whatsoever. And obviously, once you go beyond medications diagnosis to the more trans-diagnostic features, signs and symptoms, socioeconomic factors, health scores, that's all in the free text. It does get captured. And this brings to the sort of first opportunity in EHR data, which is, in some ways, the lack of structure in NHS psychiatric EHRs means that clinicians can and do write about patient disease, patient progression, patient treatment in a very, very rich, descriptive, contextual, holistic way, in providing exactly the kind of description, that kind of rich phenotyping, that rich description we've talked about, that you would want to be able to characterize a complex disease cluster like dementias. The challenge is, how do you get it out? How do you get that data into a structured format? 
that could be accessed outside the NHS. The solution is, uh, at least at Acrivia, and I'm not sure how else you do it, is natural language processing. So NLP is a uh, well-established field. It's been around for decades in various forms before even AI was involved. And what we do at Acrivia, some aspects of what we do are, are quite innovative, but the general structure of how you go about developing an NLP concept is fairly standard. You first need to define your feature of interest. You need to come up with definitions and a set of rules that describe how you would instruct a human to carry out your natural language processing task. This is absolutely critical, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second. Once you've got that schema defined, you then need a large sample of real data. Thankfully, at Acrivia, we have that. And then you give your schema to a bunch of human annotators who carry out the task that you would like your machine model to reproduce. Uh, they apply that schema to generate human annotated training data, which is then fed into a large pre-trained language model, uh, which attempts to reproduce that task. You then validate that model on unseen human annotated test data. And if it's performant, what we can do at Acrivia is then deploy any performant models at the point where trusts load data into our platform, which happens every fortnight for the 20 trusts in our network. Every new clinical note that comes in through that pipeline gets, uh, goes through our data structuring pipeline, and you get a structured representation. And if we've done our job well, what you get is a structured representation of what the clinician was originally trying to communicate when they wrote the unstructured version of the note. So as I mentioned, the first point there, that the, the uh, definition of the schema is absolutely critical to this. And this is somewhere where I see a lot of kind of out of the box NLP solutions really falling down. You can only structure what clinicians are actually writing about. It seems like a truism, it seems very obvious, but it is absolutely fundamental. For example, medications very of, uh, clinicians very often don't record dosages. Uh, they very rarely explicitly negate a medication. Clinicians very rarely write patient was not on citalopram. A lot of out-of-the-box NLP classifier solutions will have an affirmation and negation level. And if you try and develop a model like that on data like psychiatric EHRs, the model will either fail or worse, it will look like it's working, but all the model is doing is just saying every single mention it finds is an affirmation. So you can only effectively develop a schema if you base it first on what clinicians are actually writing and how they are writing about the, con you know, the, the feature of interest. And this is where, again, challenge and opportunity. You have the opportunity to embed clinical domain knowledge in your data processing because we work directly with cl clinicians at that schema design stage. We get them to help us define the way they write about uh, the diseases, their kind of understanding, their model of the disease or the feature of interest. You embed that in your NLP schema, and then if, firstly, that makes it more likely to actually work, but once you've got it working, that means that the data you extract as a result of that schema reflects that clinical understanding of the model or the feature. So what can you do this once you've got a, a, a performance system? Well, um, obviously, you want to use it to find patients. You want to use it to find features. And you want to leverage that kind of transdiagnostic information that you get in these rich clinical notes to find things that go beyond diagnosis. So a good example that's come up many, many times through the conference is identifying patients with mild cognitive impairment. The challenge you encounter here is if you've done your job well and you've embedded that clinical domain knowledge into your model, you have an exercise of translation to do because the way clinicians view the patient sitting in front of them, their models, may not be exactly the same as the models used by industry or academics in their kind of research-oriented kind of perspective. So you have an exercise of translation to bring these two ideas together. And this is reflected very clearly in the fact that the data you have available in an EHR, even one that's been enriched with NLP, is not necessarily the data that a trialist or a pharma company would like you to have. But that doesn't mean that the data can't be used to support that trial. So if we use this example of mild cognitive impairment, we've got 3.8 million patients in our, in our EHR database. If you're after patients with MCI, there is an ICD-10 code for it, but it will come as no surprise to most people in this room that if you actually look for coded diagnosis of MCI, you'll find only about 2,000 patients. I ran these numbers a few days ago. And obviously, you want those patients to be alive. This is full, historic, retrospective data. 
So you're only going to find about 1,200 patients with the coded diagnosis for reasons that we've described and I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So the question is, what data points do you have in the AHR that can point you towards the patients of interest? Well, you don't necessarily even need to use the NLP. As I said, these EHRs are designed for administrative purposes, so what administrative data is relevant to MCI? Referrals give a good option. When you have a disease domain that maps onto a particular service type, or particular service transitions, if you understand those service pathways, that gives you a much more reliable way of homing in your participants of interest. So if you look at patients referred to a memory service, this is not trivial to do. There is an exercise of harmonization, to pick up on Sarah's point earlier, that you have to do to get this. But you find a much larger population of patients, especially if it's their first referral, or they've been referred up from primary care. Obviously, you can pull in the NLP data too. 1,200 living patients with a coded MCI diagnosis, 12,000 living patients with an affirmed patient-related description of a mild cognitive impairment diagnosis in their free text. Now, that, that sort of ratio of coded to NLP-derived diagnosis varies across disease areas, but you can get gains that way. And obviously, the doors really open when you start looking at these transdiagnostic factors like health scores or even narrative descriptions of signs and symptoms. Health scores aren't recorded anywhere near as much as pharma companies would like them to be in EHRs, but they are recorded and you can extract them with NLP and that obviously narrows you in even further. So what you get is no single data point that finds your patients, but you have a kind of triangulatory approach that you can take. And this is actually quite useful because you can tune your pre-screening method to the demands of your trial. You can go very, very narrow, look for patients that meet all three criteria, all five criteria to sort of triangulate them, or you can broaden it out and look for a broader, more represent, perhaps a more representative sort of population sample. So the last thing I want to talk about is what this data then unlocks in terms of access, because if, you know, there's, if there's, this data only exists and only lives in the NHS and only NHS teams can access it, then, then we haven't done our job. I'm not going to go into the full detail of how the sort of Acrivia Health um, platform uh, data flow works, but the basic idea is that you, because the model was built out of the NHS, it's built out of a governance model and a data security model that started in the NHS and then has been layered upon to provide routes to access for third parties, and it's all centralized around that same data resource, what this enables is a kind of route back from an industry partner who might be accessing the data via our aggregate SaaS platform, very much like the kind of um, data explorer that uh, Sarah showed for DPUK, through which a third party could run feasibility counts on all of this structured data. Now you've got the data structured through NLP. You can aggregate it, and you can run aggregate level analysis of it without, without ever having to see the patient level data. You can identify your cohort of interest, or you can commission Acrivia to do it, and we can do it on that same aggregate level structured data. That query that you've identified, that cohort of interest, can then be reapplied in at one of the NHS trusts in our network, who all have an equivalent version of our platform with exactly the same structured data in it. So you have this kind of route to recontact where an industry or an academic partner has identified their cohort of interest. Acrivia has taken those queries and identified which sites in our network perhaps have the largest number of patients, have capability and capacity for the trial. We can then activate those sites through a standardized contracting process. And if you want to hear about the standardized contracting, go and talk to Brandy, who's in the audience. And once those sites are activated, those NHS trusts have the right to have the capacity, the capability to re-identify, re-contact, and recruit patients into the trial. And then they pass the con consent gateway and link back up with the, with the third party. All of that is only possible because you've got the data into a structured format. If you don't structure the medication data, if you don't structure the diagnosis, none of that data can be queried, it can't be aggregated, it can't be anonymized, and therefore you can't kind of get it out of the NHS for querying and for targeting. Once you do that data structuring, embedding that clinical domain knowledge, you can close that loop and do recruitment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, we have time for some questions. <coughs> oh, we can have the light over and the lights. A mic will find its way to you. Uh, 
Maybe yourself first, then at the back, and then we'll come over to this side of the room. Hi, uh, Chris from Kings. I'm a trial manager, so very interested in the accelerated recruitment. Uh, I don't want to talk about chat GPT either, <laughs> uh, but a few weeks ago in a preprint, there was um, a model proposed called uh, Foresight GPT, which is uh, predicting patient prognosis, uh, potential medications, and outcomes as the clinician writes their clinical history. Mm. So it's real-time mm -hmm. output. Uh, I was curious if uh, it's been explored to do the same thing, but matching patients to clinical trial registries, such as trials.gov, uh, mm. to immediately give that access to clinicians of what trials they would be eligible mm. for. Yeah. And uh, so uh, is it being explored, or is it possible? Uh, it certainly sounds possible. It's not something we've explored. Um, I think there's an awful lot you can do with AI and electronic health records. There are a ton of different application types. You can do risk prediction, you can do subtyping, you can do automatic document creation like that. You could, you know, the same models that sit behind those, you know, generative NLP models are fundamentally the same as structuring NLP models. So if you've got a structuring model that works, you can do a generative model and vice versa. All I can speak to is what we've prioritized at Acrivia, which is this structuring application, where the goal is simply to reproduce what the clinician was trying to communicate as best as possible. That's because it, it is required for our kind of ecosystem, our use case. One thing I should say, though, is that part of what we're doing this year particularly is trying to, looking at different access models, different ways for researchers to come and interrogate the data. Something I'm very, very keen to get stood up this year is the idea of placements and secondments into Acrivia. The model that I showed at the end there is only possible, that access outside of the NHS is only possible on that structured data. But obviously there's a lot of work that could be done on those free text notes themselves, and I only have a five-person AI team. So the way we can uh, bring research around the actual free text is through secondments, you know, a sort of knowledge exchange partnership, researchers coming into a Acrivia placed within the research team to, you know, apply models that have been developed elsewhere or develop their own models on the free text data. Now, there's some hurdles to overcome, particularly around IP and contracts. I don't think they're insurmountable, and it's something, as I say, we're really trying to get stood up this year. So uh, I guess my answer to the question might be, uh, we haven't tried it, but if you'd like to try it, drop me an email and we'll see if we can work, work out a way for you to do it. Very good. Question over here. Mm. Working. Um. Maybe she shouts after all. <laughs> Try shouting. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Anna from Alzheimer's Society. I'm just wondering, in terms of using this for recruitment, how much patient choice is involved in the process? So by the sounds of it, you've got the health records, mm -hmm. and you said that a third party, yourselves, reach out to the trusts where the cohorts may or may not be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how, how are the patients made aware of this being a so, so the only, the only route to recontact, the, uh, the only party that is able to actually contact and recontact those patients are the NHS trusts themselves. And that process happens through their own local recontact, opt-out procedures. So all, you know, the, the step that Acrivia takes is to provide the information on, here are the, here's the cohort query, here's the set of filters that identify patients who might be eligible for this particular project. We can help the trusts with setting up the trial infrastructure or the project infrastructure and pairing them up with the, th you know, the, the sponsor. But ultimately, it's on the trust themselves to reach out to patients, and that follows all of their own local governance procedures. As I say, because the, the security and the governance model for the whole program was built at the NHS, it has the, the local trust information governance models kind of at its foundation. Okay, I think we're going to have to move on because we're a little bit behind time. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem at all. That's great. <laughs>